So here I just put a long list of different uh, quality control uh, metrics we can use. I will try to go through these uh, and sort of the reasoning behind why we use them. You, most people don't use all of them. Uh, but if we start with sort of mapping strat statistics, like proportion of threads uh, that are uniquely mapping, mapping to exons or mRNAs and the total number of reads. Uh, this says a lot about the quality of that cell in that sample. If we have really bad mapping, uh, it might just be due to low RNA amount. You get a lot of primer dimers and so on if you have too much tagmentation versus how much cDNA you have in the sample. Uh, and then you get a lot of like weird mapping artifacts. Uh, and then, I mean, if we don't have enough reads in the cell, it, it might be a real cell in there, but we don't have enough information to really say that, something about that cell. Uh, another thing to look at is this, these spikings. So if we detect them, how many of the spiking molecules you detect in that library says something about how, what the dropout rate in that one uh, library is. And then also the ratio of spike into mRNA. So if we have a large proportion of spike in reads, we probably had too little RNA to start with. Uh, and then, of course, how many genes do we detect per cell? Uh, the issue is that it clearly correlates with the size of the cells. So if we have a homogeneous population, uh, then uh, if you have this like, really high number of gene uh, libraries, they are most likely doublets. In this case, it's, uh, actually they did, I think, pools of 10 cells in the same uh, SmartSync 2 plates and sequence together. And then you see this really distinct <laughs> pattern that uh, these are doublets or multiples. But of course, and then, if you have very few detected genes, it's most likely a failed library. So I would remove both the high and the low end if I have a homogeneous sample. But what you need to keep in mind that a lot of these different uh, QC metrics correlate. And here is actually plotted versus uh, forward scattering in facts. So the ratio of mRNA to spike in goes up. So larger cells have more mRNA and less spike in, while smaller cells. Of course, the forward scattering is not the perfect measure of cell size either. But it's good to keep in mind that if you have varying cell sizes, you probably will have varying val values on also number of detected genes, number of reads, spike in ratios, and all of these, a lot of these measures. Uh, another thing that we pretty much always look at is the mitochondrial read fraction. Uh, it's not really shown, but has been suggested that the reason why we get higher mitochondrial proportion for damaged cells, I mean, it's been shown in the experiment where they actually have really fresh nice cells and then they let them sit for a while and then they sequence additional cells that so you get higher mitochondrial proportions. And what it, I mean, it can indicate apoptosis that you get uh, more mitochondrial transcription or that as the plasma membrane is broken, a lot of the cytoplasmic mRNA leaks out but the mRNA within the mitochondria is protected and stays in there. So it seems to be an indication of like a bad library prep. It's not 100% known why, but I think this idea with the, the cytoplasmic RNA leaking out fits quite well because you also get more of nuclear reads, it looks like in the same cells. And those are also protected in the nuclei. Uh, it might be a good idea to also look at ribosomal uh, proportions, both ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins. 
uh, I've seen in some repros or samples that sat in the freezer too long, that you start getting rRNA reads, uh, most likely because you have RNA degradation and then you end up templating also the rRNA with these oligodetes. Uh, if you have, if you don't even detect, I mean, the ribosomal proteins you should always have in most cell types, right? Uh, at least any cell type that is actively tra uh, translating uh, proteins. Uh, it might be low in red blood cells and so on. But uh, there, there has been also shown that sample handling and so on can bias the proportion of ribosomal proteins you have in your samples and can also indicate low quality uh, cells. And then of course for full length methods we can look for uh, the coverage uh, across the genes. So perfect good quality uh, RNA, you should have coverage all over the gene while if you get RNA fragmentation and you capture the poly A tail, uh, then you will get a strong three prime bias because you will mainly just sequence the three prime end of transcripts. So for smart sec two, I always look at this also. And uh, cells that look like this, I would probably discard. But if we now go back to this uh, list of uh, things, oops, I can't click on it. The things I would mainly look at is number of detected genes and mitochondrial read fraction, I always look at. If it's smart check two, I would also look at present uniquely mapping and spike in. And then, I mean, you can add in all of these different things. A lot of them are correlated uh, depending on the samples. If they're really tricky, you might want to look at all different quality control metrics you can think of. But at least uh, these ones you should always look for, I would say. But then how do we filter? Uh, I suggest you always plot them, either as violin plots, which we would do in the uh, lab, or as histograms, as in this example. And then make some reasonable decisions about where to draw the cutoff. Quite often, uh, I would use something like uh, take the distribution, take uh, two standard deviations from the median, and uh, set an initial cutoff, but then I would always look at it and see, does this make sense? Uh, so here you have a few extreme cases of really high gene detection that are most likely doublets, and these are most likely failed libraries. So you can, it's something to really look at, think about what is the cell composition in my sample? Is it a very homogeneous population where I expect the same cell sizes for all of them? Then you should look for really, then you can do quite strict cutoffs. But if it's a heterogeneous population, it's really hard to do this filtering in a reasonable way. Uh, and maybe you don't want to remove the high end here, but instead do some doublet prediction. Uh, you can also, there are some tools to do. You take all the matrix with all these different quality control metrics that I mentioned, and you run PCA with that and detect outliers. Of course, these outliers might be one small cell population I have or one large cell population I have. So you always need to go back and think about what it is you're removing. Mm. And with uh, drop seek data, it's also fairly common to plot these uh, number of UMIs versus number of genes and detect outliers like this. And also, as I said, 
the distribution of uh, here is a number of U mice, but I, I would rather do a number of genes. So I think I said this pretty much. Really think about what you expect from uh, your population. It's also, do you have cycling cells? If the cells are cycling, they will double in size during cell cycle progression, right? So when you have a cell just about to divide, it will be twice as big as after it divided. And that of course will also give differences in uh, how many genes we detect and so on. So be, think about what you need to remove. Uh, will I remove some larger cell type or a smaller cell type? Uh, it is quite a good idea to maybe go through this with iterations you do. First, not so strict filtering, you run the PCA, TSNI, UMAP, plot it, see what it looks like. Do I need to go back and filter more? It's a very iterative process uh, in most projects. So you realize, oh no, now I have this doublet cluster. I need to remove those also. And then you go back and you rerun whatever you did again. And, oh, is it already 12? Can you bear with me a while longer or should we take lunch? Continue. You think so, yeah. Uh, we'll uh, start with exercise a bit later then. We also need to filter genes. I mean, most analysis you don't do with all the genes. Uh, you mainly do gene set selection. I mean, genes that are only detected in uh, like five cells with more than one read or RPKM value higher than one and so on. We will also talk more about variable genes later, but uh, also, you can select genes just based on like prior knowledge. I only want to look at immune genes or differential expressed genes from some bulk data, top principal components. There's a lot of ways to select them. But I think I suggest you always plot these kind of plots where you look at what's the most expressed genes in our data. In this case, uh, we have the spikens. So these are one, some of the highest expressed genes. And of course, that's okay. You would remove them before doing clustering regardless. But it's quite often you have some nuclear link RNAs taking up a big proportion of uh, your read counts. And MALAT1 is one of these that quite often pops up. Um, in, and of course, if you have high mitochondrial content, a lot of the genes on your list here will be mitochondrial genes. Also, actin and hemoglobin are quite often seen. Uh, what I've seen in some projects is that uh, MALAT1 uh, correlates with mitochondrial proportion uh, in some samples. So this could be, as I talked about before, this breakage of the cytoplasm. So, so we lose a lot of the cytoplasmic mRNAs, but the nuclear mitochondrials are ma maintained. And I would suggest if you have a few weird link RNAs that are popping up and are like 30, 40% of your reads, uh, remove them when you, because they will influence normalization so much also. If you have some cells where 30% of the reads is this individual link RNA. Um, and then of course, always remove uh, the mitochondrial uh, genes uh, before doing normalizations, because we can fairly safely assume that the proportion of mitochondrial reads is mainly technical. And if you have very hard time finding your cell type signal, you might remove like housekeeping genes like ribosomal genes and so on to enrich for the signal you're looking for. Then uh, pretty much always these kind of experiments, you will have batch effects, batch effect due to dissociation, effect sorting, library prep and so on. 
So keep in mind when you do experiments, everything that happened to these samples, how you handled them, what was done. And once you have your sequencing done, check any QC measure poor batches. Like here, uh, which date were they picked? Uh, which date was the library prep done? In this case, it's MARSEC2 data with multiple plates. Uh, like here, we can see we have better mapping for our samples from one day. We have less spike in and for the samples from this day. It's good to know uh, what kind of differences you have between your batches. And then we'll talk later about how to control for it. But always be aware. And then if you see that this one batch really had low quality all over, you might need to consider, can I remove this batch? Instead of trying to force it to integrate and not really get more than noise from it. And then of course, PCA uh, is a good tool when you look at PC. And what you should be aware of is if you do, don't do any tweaking with your data and run a PCA, pretty much always PC one or two looks like this. Here it's colored by number of detected genes in the sample. So the highly and the lowly end up like this. So it's like the strongest variation you have in your data will most likely be the number of reads and the number of detected genes. Um, and of course, we want to uh, separate them on something else. This might be biological also, if you have different cell sizes. So always like plot your different batches in PCA uh, and look at what pieces uh, correlate most with your batches to figure out if you have a batch effect at all. Do I need to deal with it or does it look perfect? Uh, you can use it to identify contaminant cells. Like in this case, we were sorting for PIDX3 EGFP uh, cells, and we end up with a lot of cells that are most likely not the cell type we want to do, like oligodendrocytes. So then basically we remove them uh, by clustering. Uh, 